Okay, now moving on to our next aspect of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium that we're going to be examining, we'll be looking at population size. So remember the Weinberg assumption was that population size was infinite, but we've actually already seen a little bit about the effect of population size because smaller populations caused higher values of F, right? The small population resulted in unavoidable inbreeding and caused that small population to act as if it was inbreeding and maybe have more inbreeding depression than a larger population would have. And that's our first thing. The second thing about population size is that stochasticity, randomness, becomes important. And one metaphor to think about to kind of help understand this is if you think about Las Vegas and you've got individuals who are gamblers and are going to gamble in Las Vegas, when someone goes to Las Vegas and they gamble, well, how do they do? Well, it depends on how lucky they are, right? They might be lucky and win money and come back with more than they went with. They might be unlucky and come back with less. So how they do is greatly determined by chance, right? And this is distinct from casinos, right? The other side of that gambling equation. Casinos don't worry about luck, right? Casinos have very reliable revenues every single month. They basically know exactly how much money they will make, but they're playing the same game, right? They're playing against gamblers, playing the same thing. The difference is, for any individual gambler, the number of gambles that they do is actually fairly small, right? at most a few hundred bets or something, right? Whereas for casinos, that number is actually very large. And when you have a small number of events where chance is important, chance has a big effect on your overall outcome. But when you have a large number of events where chance is maybe important for each of those events, the overall outcome is no longer determined by chance. It becomes very reliable and consistent. And so, um, the analog here is for populations of organisms. If it's a very, very large population, that population will be more like a casino, and things are more predictable, and all those equations that we derive will be um, accurate. But for smaller populations, they're a bit more like um, gamblers, where the number of reproductions is small, or chance events can have a bigger effect, the equations that we derived may not be as accurate because randomness becomes really important. So this is one thing to keep in mind is the effect of randomness. Now let's return to this effect of population size on F. So let's think about what F would be in some next time period. Okay? So now we're going to think about how F may change from one generation to the next. This was also the probability of two alleles being exactly the same. So what is the probability in the next generation that if I pick two alleles, they're exactly the same? Okay, so I have my two alleles that I'm going to pick in the next generation. All right, so I pick the first allele, and it has some sort of value. And now I'm going to pick a second allele. What's the probability that it's exactly the same thing? Well if it arose from the same allele in the previous generation, um, that would give you this being the same. Right? So if I'm thinking about the probability of being identical by descent in the next generation, well, it's the probability that if I've picked one, what's the probability the second one is exactly the same? Well, it's 1 over 2n. If I think about this population having n individuals, it would be 2n alleles. If I've already got one, what's the probability that second one was the exact same one? It's um, whatever the frequency was in this population. So F for the next generation is going to be the probability that I end up picking the exact same allele both times. But then there's another way for these two alleles to be identical by descent. That would be if they are not the exact same allele, Right, so this is like the probability that they would be different alleles in the previous generation. So that would be a situation where, for example, I have my two alleles I'm focusing on. This one 
comes from some allele in the previous generation here. This one comes from some other different allele in the previous generation. That's the probability it comes from a different allele, but that different allele could have itself been identical by descent in the previous generation. Maybe they were the same in the previous generation. So the probability that two alleles are identical by descent in the next generation is the probability I just picked the same allele both times, plus the probability that I picked different alleles, but they were identical by descent in the previous generation. So starting off with this equation, let me think about how things change over time. So the first thing I'll do in my derivation is I'm going to take one um, minus each of these sides. So this looks kind of strange, but um, we're doing this um, in order to get um, our good final equation. So 1 minus this side. Right. 1 minus this. 1 minus all of that. So now let's work with this right hand side. 1 minus 1 over 2n minus 1 minus 1 over 2n times f of t. Now I actually have a 1 minus 1 over 2n here and a 1 minus 1 over 2n here. This thing is kind of all multiplied by 1 if you think about it that way. So I pull this out. And that's times 1 minus f of t. And if you see what's happened here, 1 minus f of t plus 1 is just 1 minus 1 over 2n times 1 minus f of t. So this is similar to the equation that we got when we did the migration. If we were to continue this and think about how does this change generation by generation by generation, at some time 1 minus f of t, we would have 1 minus 1 over 2n t times times 1 minus f of 0, the original value of f. So let's look at the kind of implications of this equation. 1 minus f of t was equal to 1 minus 1 over 2n raised to the power t, 1 minus f of 0, where this is the initial value of f, like generation 0. After t generations, this is the value of f after t generations. So let's simplify things. Let's think about this process. Let's assume that f of 0 is equal to 0. So let's start off with a population that's completely genetically variable. All the alleles are unique. There's no alleles that are identical by descent. How does this simplify? You would get 1 minus f of t equals 1 minus 1 over 2n raised to the power t, and then just 1, right, because 1 minus 0 is just 1. We can rearrange this a little bit, so add f of t and subtract this. So f of t equals 1 minus 1 minus 1 over 2n raised to the power t. Now let's think about what's happening here with this equation. This thing in parentheses is less than 1, and we're raising it to a power. So as t gets big, as t goes to infinity, right, as this becomes large, it's an exponent on something that is less than 1. So this whole thing, um, the second term here, would go to 0, which means um, 1 minus 0, you would just get 1. So as t goes to infinity, f of t would go to 1. But if you think about this, um, how fast this occurs, if n is very, very, very large, then this last part here is very, very, very small. You basically get something like 1 raised to a power. So this process here, f will increase slower for larger values of n. So we expect in the long run, f of t will become 1. But this whole process will become, will be more slow for larger populations. 
But what does f of t equal to 1 mean? f of t equal to 1 means that all the alleles are identical by descent, and that means there's no genetic variation at all. And so this brings up a, a question, well, if this is true, right, if finite population size causes f to increase, and in the long run, f will go to 1, and all alleles will be added by descent, and there should be no genetic variation, the question is, um, what prevents essentially f equals 1 for all populations? What actually prevents all of nature from becoming homozygous individuals with the same allele? Well, the answer is that mutations, each generation, they create new alleles that are not identical by descent, right? So we have this process that's occurring continuously where small population size, or non-infinite population size, is pushing populations to lose their genetic diversity while mutations are creating genetic diversity. But mutations are very rare, right? So this actually, this whole process, this works very slowly, right? Mutations are rare, so mutations create new alleles slowly, and this is why we're concerned about small populations. Small populations will lose their genetic diversity much more quickly. A small population does not have a larger mutation rate. Right? Mutation rate is independent of the size of the population. That's an individual trait. So small populations will find themselves at a point where their mutation rate can't keep up with the loss of genetic diversity due to the small population size. Whereas in larger populations, the new mutations um, will occur often enough um, because they're more individuals. The mutation rate will be able to balance out this loss of genetic diversity because of the finite population size, and they'll be able to maintain genetic diversity over time. All of this math that we've just been doing can be done in another perspective, and I mention this just because um, if you look at other sources, you may see a focus not so much on F, but instead on heterozygosity. So you can actually derive an equation that looks like this, focusing on the heterozygotes, and we're thinking about what are the probability that two alleles are not identical by descent. That would come from what are the probability they're not identical by descent. It's the probability they were not identical by descent in the previous generation um, times the probability that different alleles were chosen. And all that same sort of thing, if this is the frequency of heterozygotes, the frequency of heterozygotes goes down as time increases, and that frequency of heterozygotes goes down um, slower for larger populations, okay, because of that. Um, you can redo all the math we just did with the F statistics from the point of view of heterozygotes, derive this result. You get the same conceptual results that genetic diversity is eliminated over long periods of time, and the speed at which it is eliminated depends on the population size. And I mention that here because um, different textbooks you look will have different formulas of this. And then the next thing we're going to be looking at is this n here that's determining um, how fast f is going to 1 or how fast h is going to 0. These are both based on the population size. But it turns out population size itself can be a bit more complex because as we saw, with an inbreeding population, it acted as if it had a smaller population in the sense that it lost genetic diversity more quickly. So our next topic is to look at different factors that make populations act as if they have population sizes different from just the number of individuals. How does inbreeding or other factors make a population act as if it was a smaller population so it loses genetic diversity more quickly? 
or act as if it's a larger population and maybe preserves genetic diversity for longer periods.